the very rules of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is how can the whole state of things, a pure violence without object. This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to this week's edition of Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins. As always, we are sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we introduce today's guest, I just want to mention that we do have a Patreon account at patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. Consider dropping us a buck a month there. And if not, perhaps leave us a nice review on iTunes, maybe something like Down With The Law or something since we're on a Sterner <laughs> episode. But we're very pleased, once again, to have Saul Newman join us. This will be his first time on the show with Taylor, so I'm very excited to listen to these two go back and forth. But Saul, I would say, is is probably one of the foremost scholars working in the kind of post-anarchist milieu, let's say. But today we're going to be focusing on his more recent work, which has centered around the concept of political theology. So the focus of our discussion is going to be on, on two works. Political Theology, A Critical Introduction, and a forthcoming book, Order, Crisis, and Redemption, Political Theology After Schmidt. But Saul, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, it's it's good to see you. Good to have you back. Likewise. Good to be back. And it's great to meet you, uh, Saul. And and now this, this <clears throat> forthcoming book for SUNY Press, which I assume is going to get published this year by the by the date, you, you wrote it with a, with a colleague, correct? That's right. Peter Langford, yeah, who's a, a, a lecturer in, in legal theory. So he knows that he knows that that side of Schmidt's kind of uh, legal theory uh, quite well. It should be out hopefully uh, late this year or early next year. I would say actually, um, it's just going through the kind of review stages right now. So, you know, since we don't really go in any order, uh, I'm going to preempt what we have here. But I'm curious because I think it, it's a good way to start just for the for the general audience because I haven't delved into Schmidt too much except for some of the the main works like like political theology and the concept of political. But you do see that his theoretical writings, his, his writings on law, on sovereignty, are mm. still very widely discussed. Do you mm. want to say a, a little bit about his relevance for today? I know you you articulate this in the uh, introduction to Order, Crisis, and Redemption, but just for the general mm. audience listening, can you say a little bit about why Schmidt is still so uh, yeah so well, important to deal with? You know, in some ways, the book is uh, an attempt to kind of, you know, rethink the, the relevance of Schmidt. So on the one hand, it's an attempt to, um, you know, think about how it's still relevant. So on the other hand, it's it's also an attempt to kind of exorcise the demon of Schmidt yeah. like, or, or put Schmidt to bed. I mean, so in a way, the, the message of the book really is that, you know, that the Schmidt's sort of theory of... Um, political theology um, is kind of relevant, I suppose, to to crises of legitimacy, you know, where mm-hmm. every, every time mm-hmm. the, the political order, like the contemporary, you know, liberal or neoliberal political or global order is, is kind of in a state of crisis. This is when, you know, the whole question of kind of authority and legitimacy and, and the sources of authority arise, right? So, so you know, Schmidt's obviously writing during the, the kind of the Weimar crisis um, mm-hmm. in the 20s and 30s in Germany. You know, the Weimar Republic, the, the state was very kind of, you know, weakened political structure and it was kind of being being assailed on all sides from, you know, the radical right and the radical left. And we had, you know, the crises of hyperinflation and so on. So Schmidt, in various works around this time, not just political theology, but also, you know, his his uh, work on, the, you know, the, on constitutional theory, for instance, is really an attempt to kind of um, develop a, a sort of a theory of sovereignty that can kind of withstand some of these pressures and tensions you know he's kind of making an argument for a form of sovereign dictatorship right so a form mm-hmm. of sovereignty which can kind of suspend the constitutional order and declare a kind of a state of exception and you know and bring in emergency measures you know it's about this question of legitimacy and authority right and it seems to me that you know today we're kind of experiencing very much a similar crisis but possibly even yes. e- even more profound especially with kind of you know the, the kind of the ecological crisis and you know mm-hmm. geopolitical instability so Schmidt is, is relevant from kind of a diagnostic point of view. On the other hand, I mean, you know, the solutions he offers, which is, you know, essentially a form of authoritarian sovereignty, just simply doesn't doesn't work today, right? So it's an attempt to kind of, you know, think 
beyond Schmidt, think past him, try to um, explore the ways in which his understanding of sovereignty is, is kind of internally contradictory and completely untenable today, as well as to think about, you know, for instance, you know, the Anthropocene condition, right? I mean, that, you know, Schmidt has no capacity within his, um, you know, very sort of anthropocentric notion of political theology. He has no capacity to kind of think about the Anthropocene and, and you know, ecological entanglement and the environmental crisis. I mean, one of the other things that we talk about is the way in which Schmidt's theory of um, or Schmidt's political theology in, in some ways kind of ties in with, you know, the, the resurgence of right-wing populism, which in some ways is kind of direct throwback to Schmidt. I mean, I mean, what, what the populist demand is strong sovereignty, you know, which, which can kind of, um, you know, it's kind of, it's conservative revolution, isn't it? I mean, what, mm-hmm. what do the sort of the Steve Bannons of the world talk about? It? It's this idea of tearing down the administrative state, you know, yep. um, strong sovereignty, strong national borders, you know, ripping up um, international law and um, basically disrupting the, uh, the kind of the liberal kind of global order right so um so in some ways you know what we're seeing now is very much sort of a throwback i would say to yeah. political theology right so so what we try to do in the book really um is to try to kind of explore a number of kind of internal tensions and contradictions and sort of limitations in schmidt's kind of sovereign centric model of political theology and actually one of the interesting connections which, which you you know which um which what one of your uh, questions um touches on just the interview questions here is, is the, the, sort of the connection between Schmidt and anarchism. So, you know, Schmidt is is often seen as kind of a, a critic of liberalism and, and, right. and, and he certainly is because, you know, he associates liberalism with um, kind of... Not being able to make a decision. Well, right? Exactly. Exactly. That's right. Not being able yeah. to make a decision precisely. You know, it's all, you know, liberalism is all about sort of, you know, negotiation and mm-hmm. mediation, that kind of thing, as well as kind of the uh, the ideology of, of individualism. But actually, um, Schmidt's real enemy, it seems to me, is, is not so much liberalism, but revolutionary anarchism. This is really what he's um, what, what he's afraid of, and um, so if you, you look at the way in which the political theology and, and various other texts around this time, this is kind of haunted by the ghosts of Bakunin and yep. uh, Proudhon, and um, so these are the ones that he's really sort of engaged in a, in a critical dialogue with. And interestingly, his idea of the the sovereign state of exception. Mm-hmm. Is a certain kind of anarchy of power, right? So it's the right. idea that, that sovereignty becomes, in a way, kind of anarchic, anarchic in the bad sense, right? In the sense it's completely unhinged from any sort of, you know, normative order or, or the rule of law. You know, the, so- the sovereign can simply do what it wants. So in a strange kind of uncanny way, right? The sovereign state kind of mirrors, to some degree, a, a certain kind of anarchy, and it's almost as if, you know, to kind of ward off the threat of revolutionary anarchism, sovereignty has to become anarchic. It has to kind of sort of detach itself from from any kind of constraint. There's a very interesting kind of um, almost subterranean dialogue, if you like, between, between Schmidt and, and, uh, and anarchism, which we explore in this book, as well as, as, well as with a number of other uh, interlocutors, including Leo Strauss and Jakob mm-hmm. Taubes and so on. So, But essentially, it's a, it's a broad-ranging critique of Schmidt's model of political theology, essentially. This is one of the things I found extremely fascinating was the the sort of mirror image. I mean, mm. not to anticipate discussing Lacan, but just like the sort of inverted mirror image of something that Schmidt said that really crystallized this about Bakunin, which was basically how his sort of uh, his anti-statist and sort of anti-theological right. impetus becomes in a certain way, more theological or yes. more status. Do you want to say like a little bit of word about yeah, that? Yeah, that's very interesting, actually. Yeah, so he accuses Schmidt of being the, um, sorry, he accuses Bakunin of being the um, dictator of the anti-dictatorship. And right. The, and the, what does he say, the, the theologian of the anti-theological or something like uh, this. So, so, yeah. so suggesting that, you know, because Bakunin is so strident in his critique of um, God and the state, you know, if you read his little essay, God and the state, it's really kind of a declaration of war on on these sort of the twin idols, if you like, of, of um, institutionalized religion and sovereignty. So, you know, he says, that, you know, these two concepts kind of um, kind of reinforce each other. And actually, by the way, you know, I mean, the, the very term political theology, uh, at least in, in modernity, really comes from Bakunin. You know, his little, little essay on um, his polemic against the Italian uh, Republican statesman uh, right. uh, Mazzini is entitled the, the Political Theology or Mazzini's Political Theology or something like this. So, so in a way, I mean, Schmidt is kind of sort of responding to Bakunin's first kind of critique of political theology, if you like. So what does Schmidt mean by Bakunin becoming the falling to a political theological trap? I mean, I think he makes reference to Bakunin's Satanism. So Bakunin kind of... Um, he kind of affirms this sort of image of Satan as being this kind of, you know, the great liberator of humanity, the eternal rebel, the one who kind of overthrows the, you know, God's authority and rebels against God. The Milton, the John Milton. Exactly, that's right. right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so, so Bakunin sort of sees Satan as kind of like positive figure for human emancipation. And I suppose 
that's really what Schmidt is is partly referring to, at least anyway, that Bakunin's critique of, of theology and, and religion and religious authority is so extreme that he has to rely on sort of, you know, religious and theological tropes to make his critique, you know, which, which is quite interesting, actually. Um, I mean, the reference to the being the dictator of the anti-dictatorship, I guess, is a reference to, you know, Bakunin's interest in what he called the sort of the secret society, these kind of, you know, secret ah, yeah. conspiratorial revolutionary societies, which he said would be, you know, quite sort of, close in knit and um and Bakunin was at times sort of accused of um of kind of advocating these sort of secret dictatorships, secret revolution <laughs> dictatorships. It's probably a, a sort of slight misreading, I would say, of Bakunin, but um mm-hmm. he does make an interesting point which I try to explore um in my first book on political theology. You know, does anarchism is anarchism a certain kind of political theology, right? But I look at, for instance, a, a Christian anarchism, which is which is an interesting philosophy. Actually, um, people like Jacques Ellul and various other figures um, basically argue that you know Christianity itself is you know if, if you look at the real message of Christianity and, and the Sermon on the Mount, it's really yes. a, a message of um, of anarchism. Essentially, mm-hmm. it's it, it's an indifference to the order of political and legal power. So there is that kind of connection between which I try to explore between theology and anarchism. So even though anarchism is usually seen as a, as a completely sort of you know secular, um, right, you know materialist kind of uh, anti-religious philosophy, that there are you know anarchism is a very sort of broad church. If we'll forgive the pun, right? I mean, there's, there's you know there, there is a kind of a you know a religious dimension, and, and certainly in the case with Judaism too, of course, right? I mean, you know Walter Benjamin, Martin Buber, Franz Rosenweig. I mean, they, they all Gustav Landau. I mean, they all have this sort of connection with. Um, or make this connection between sort of theology and uh, and anarchism. Well, so certainly, you know, certainly messianism, the messianic, right, and anarchism, right. So, so what I try to do really is kind of explore the sort of the radical anarchistic dimension of theology by essentially detaching theology f- from the kind of the Schmittian paradigm, right. I mean, essentially, Schmidt's political theology is totally reductionist. I mean, he, he essentially it's a political religion, really, rather than a political theology. I mean, he's essentially kind of uh, recruiting theology on a very sort of narrow reading into a way of legitimizing political power. And uh, this is really an anathema, I think, to the true message of theology, right? In a way, theology cannot be used to justify power, right? I mean, you know, the kingdom of God is not is not the kingdom of man and, and, and yeah. never can be, right? So, um, you know, you know, there is this kind of sort of radical reading, if you like, of theology, you know, which is also explored by a number of German theologians like, you know, Jürgen Moldman, um, Johannes Baptist Metz, the whole idea of liberation theology. Just to inter- mm. uh, interrupt for mm. a second, what was, uh, I, I'm trying to remember the friend that had a critique of Schmidt. Is it Keller? Is it, what, what's his name? Um, he's attacking the- Schmidt for, he's calling Schmidt basically a pagan for, for. Oh, his- yes, yes, yes. Eric Peterson. Yes. Peterson. Okay. Yeah, 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 I, yeah, I'm yeah, way yeah. off. <laughs> That was one of Schmidt's contemporaries. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, no, absolutely. I mean, it's a great work um, on um, it's called um, it's called monotheism, and uh, yeah, he basically, in a kind of a oblique reference to Schmidt, I mean, he basically says that you know uh, political theology is paganism, right? I mean, yeah. so so he's he's saying that you know Christian or Catholic theology is is trinitarian. It's about the triune God. You know, God right. is not not one at three. Yet Schmidt is trying to kind of create a a monotheism out of Catholic theology, right? I mean, to, to kind of justify this idea of, of the sovereign being the sort of singular soul, you know, decider, right? And that's totally, he would say that's totally incompatible with Christian theology. Even in Schmidt's own time, you know, he was, um, <laughs> his political theology was was considered hugely controversial and, and really as having very little to do with Christianity. So, so yeah, that's another interesting debate that, um, that, that we explore in this book, of course. What else is interesting for me with, with Schmidt is, it is this notion that you explore in your first book on political theology, as you said, mm-hmm. where you're kind of showing how there are these other means by which mm-hmm. sovereignty is thought of. And it's not merely like, for example, with Freud's myth of the, the primal horde, it's the mm-hmm. it's the mm-hmm. murder of the of the exception that constitutes the kind of the prohibitions and the laws and everything right, else right. that kind of come along with it. So it's kind of interesting to think of these other interlocutors that you bring in. I mean, Freud just being one of them yes, that, yes. That, that, that thinks of the exception in a, in a way in which Schmidt hadn't, whereas Schmidt has kind of like a positive conception of sovereignty and exception. Mm. And in Freud, there is this different image, which you explore not only mm. in um, T- Totem and Taboo or Future of the Illusion, but also Mo- Moses. And Moses monotheism. And monotheism. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Do you want to say a little bit about this? One of these versions of sort of the sovereign exception 
in this different vein? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, the interesting thing about Freud is that you know the the sons murder the the father, of course, and turn him into boon and remove the exception. But what do they do? They they invent a new structure of authority, a new order of repression. The murder of the father was supposed to sort of liberate them from from you know sexual prohibition, but it simply creates a, a, a new kind of um, an internalized you know, exactly in, in, yeah. an internalized god, of course. I mean, that, that's really mm-hmm. the the. Um, I suppose the the kind of the, the message of, of psychoanalysis that you know mm-hmm. God God becomes internalized right in the form right. of the, uh, the superego and you know something Lacan also talks about you know when, mm-hmm. when he, he has a reference to um, to Dostoevsky and the brothers Karamazov right. you know um, you know the famous inversion that you know God is dead now everything is forbidden or now nothing is permitted right yeah. so so once again the removal of this sort of authoritarian external figure of God, the figure of or well, the symbol of prohibition doesn't free you, it doesn't liberate you. On the contrary, it actually internalizes God, right? So right. The, the murder of God simply internalizes God in the form of the unconscious. Escaping the exception, you might say, is, is actually um it's actually rather a difficult enterprise, it would say, right. actually, because you know, um it always becomes sort of uh internalized, I guess you could say. Structure of law or authority becomes internalized, and and the whole point, of course, about the superego in Freud is that the superego is completely excessive. It's not the sort of the rational voice of the law. The superego right. is, is punitive. It's aggressive. It's precisely like the primal father, right? Right in the in totem and taboo. That's the whole point. So, um, so the, I mean, there's just so many interesting connections. I think that you can explore between you know the sort of the exceptional structure of sovereignty on the one hand and the kind of the dynamics of the unconscious on the other. Since we did bring up psychoanalysis, I was just thinking this exception bit seems like perhaps related to the sexual non-relation, which you do discuss a bit mm. in, in political theology, right? Mm, yeah. Yes, in, in relation to Lacan, that's, that's a very complicated argument, actually. I, mean, I, <laughs> yeah. I spent quite a lot of time trying to kind of get my head around exactly what Lacan was saying, and I, you know, I haven't read Seminar 20 on the feminine Jewissons. I mean, it nearly did my head in, actually. Of course, yeah. of course, yes. <laughs> I'm actually just trying to remember how, how, the, how the whole argument goes, really. But um, I think what he says is that in terms of sort of male sexuality, I think there is always the exception. There's always this sort of fantasy of the of the right. primal father or, or the one who, you know, the, the figure of jurisance, if you like, the, the one yes. who's kind of outside of the, the normal constraints and prohibitions which everyone else submits to. Maybe in men there is this sort of fantasy. There's always some other guy out there who's, like, you know, getting laid all the time and is completely unconstrained and, you know, outside the, the normal... Don Juan. <laughs> the Don Juan, uh, outside yeah. the normal kind of constraints that our normal everyday neurotics, you know, have to submit to. Uh, so I think there is some kind of truth about that. Whereas I think his point about women or about, fem- you know, the female position, if you like, I mean, you know, Lacan's never talking about biological men and women. He's talking about, you know, sort of structural discursive positions, if you like. Um, but I think he says that for women, that there is no exception. There is no fantasy of the exception, But which is actually paradoxically actually why, you know, feminine jurisance isn't so subordinate to the law. So right. we, just, we just have to remember the sort of the paradoxical nature of the exception, right? It's precisely because of the exception that the law is enforced. It's precisely right. because there's some point outside the law, if you like whether it's sovereignty, whether it's a primal father or the figure mm-hmm. of Jurassance, it's precisely precisely this kind of point of exception, which in a way guarantees the consistency and the foundation of the law. The interesting thing is when you remove the exception, the law itself becomes much more precarious, it seems to me. Well, this is like foreclosure, right? The name of the father right, is, right, is exactly. foreclosed yeah. and it, it returns in the real. Or another way to put it is, I mean, Schmidt himself seems to kind of acknowledge this. I mean, whether or not this has to do with sexuality, but it, if mm. you just logically look at the diagram from Seminar 20 uh, with what does he say about the exception? It's not based on the norm. And in fact, is mm. what enforces it, as you said, exactly, or what yeah. establishes it. Yeah, it guarantees the norm and allows the norm to be applied. So so this it's very paradoxical notion isn't it that you need some point outside the structure in order for the structure to um the phallus or to, the to function yeah, exactly the that's right yes yes, yes. You, yeah. yeah yeah exactly this also reminds me of um gosh thinking about feminine jouissance this feels like something else that i think schmidt would be afraid is really sort of threatened by like, <laughs> is feminine yeah. jouissance, right it's like a because it's yeah. like a decode it, honestly <clears throat> I, you know i'm read this as like a decoded flow like it's the decoded mm. flows mm. ultimately that that's the real political divide is between the people that are that want to co- overcode mm. or code a heavily coded mm. society and those who want a more decoded. No, or open I mean, it, absolutely. I mean, if I think if it, if it's one way of sort of characterizing Schmidt, I mean, Schmidt is is a theorist of, of order, order yes. and, and limits and authority and and structure. This is like the sort of the imperative or the motif that runs right throughout his work. You know, um, mm-hmm. from from the earliest work right through to his very latest. It's this kind of obsession with 
pinning things down into their appropriate categories, providing a, a kind of a, um, a way of sort of legitimizing the political order. Because, you know, as, as Jakob Taubes, his, his sort of um, interlocutor once said, you know, I mean, what Schmidt really wants to prevent is the apocalypse. Yes, um, the, ca- the catacomb. Know, the, right? Exactly, that's right. So, so this is why he's, he's interested in the catacomb, right? Because, I mean, the catacomb is something which ultimately delays the, the sort of the coming of the, you know, the kingdom of God and, you know, the apocalypse and so on. Because, you know, what Schmidt wants to do at all costs is basically preserve the political order. Even to the point of destroying it, right? right? I, mean, I mean, you know, why is it that Schmidt sides with the the Nazis? Why does he actually join the Nazi Party in 1933? Um, yes, partly out of opportunism, but been, right. I think I think basically he believed that the Nazi Party was the only uh, political force that could actually defend the political order. But of course, what does what does Nazism do after you know? Um, uh, you know, thirty-three to forty-five basically ends up destroying the German state. I mean, the German yeah. state commit commits suicide, right? The so suicidal to, light of flight. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. So, end, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So this is what the conservative revolution is all about. I mean, the conservative revolution in 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 seeking to conserve the political order it always ends up destroying it. You know, and it's I, preci- precisely what right wing populism is is all about. Essentially, right. conservative revolution. So this was something I was thinking about when what I was thinking there were all these conspiracies with Bush, but it became even more so with Trump with uh, recognizing the capital of Israel as Jerusalem. And there's mm-hmm. like these thoughts that it's about. I'm going to box this, but it's there's this kind of anecdote theory tale that the beginning of the end of the world is going to sort of culminate mm-hmm. with. Is it the rebuilding of the temple? It's the yes. Uh, you, you, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. You guys kind of know what I'm part, talking about, yeah. right? And so right. There, there were. I had some in, in my family, you know, uncle cousins out there that are a little bit, you know, uh, into this kind of thing. And so, as part of it was, <laughs> I remember a Jehovah's Witness came and was basically trying to talk to me about Trump, and I, mm-hmm. I just didn't <laughs> want to talk about. It. I offhandedly called him the Antichrist, and they were like, "Isn't that a good thing? He's bringing about." the end times right right and i was like i, I was like okay I, I walked into that one let's not uh yeah. not to dwell on trump i was just thinking about yeah. how th- this figure of the exception can also function against the catacomb can can function for the eschaton no, absolutely that's right i mean that's that's one of the uh points i make in the book actually that the um the idea of sovereignty is no, is no longer really on the side of order it's now on the side of disorder right yes, so right. um sovereign exceptionalism is something which is precisely destroying the um yeah. the kind of the, the global order as, as we once knew it you know you yeah. look at everything that's, that's gone on just recently with um you know with the invasion of ukraine for instance mm-hmm. i mean, I mean yeah. you know putin decides one day just just to you know what the fuck i'm just gonna i'm just gonna invade ukraine you know and yeah. um you know, what? kind of somehow sort of reinvent, you know, this messianic fantasy of the Russian Empire and meanwhile sort of destabilize the entire sort of world order. So Trump was a disruptor too, and precisely in the same kind of way. So what I really liked was your reading of Walter Bonjamin and the origins of German uh, tragedy or German right. theater. Do you want to say just a little bit about this interesting notion of the sovereign in these in the Baroque German uh, right. yeah. plays? There's an interesting question about, about you know um well this kind of if you like a sort of a subterranean dialogue that was going on between schmidt and, and benjamin um so i mean georgia garman for instance claims that that uh, schmidt's political theology was kind of like a bleak response to benjamin's critique of violence and um and then benjamin's uh thing on the uh, the origins of, of german tragic drama can actually be seen in a way as a kind of response to schmidt's political theology even though interesting not- they're not actually directly referring to each other. But anyway, so so Benjamin talks about the Baroque sovereign and, you know, he, he talks about the way in which, you know, the, the function of sovereignty or the function of the idea of sovereignty in that kind of period is, is to kind of prevent the the state of emergency, right? To prevent the, you know, the crisis, the um, right. the great sort of disordering of, of the world, right? So, you know, the whole Baroque period, he says, is sort of haunted by the sort of spectre of catastrophe. Interesting. Uh, and, and the role of the sovereign really is to kind of, you, you know, sort of maintain stability, right? But to do that, the sovereign needs to make decisions. But his point, of course, is that the sovereign cannot make decisions. You know, the sovereign is incapable of, of acting decisively. It's almost like a sort of a, like a comical sort of send up of the Schmittian notion of the sovereign yeah. decision, right? So so Schmidt says, well, what is sovereignty what is sovereignty all about? It's about the capacity to make decisions, to make yeah. kind of exist- existential decisions, to defend the political order. And Benjamin says actually that if you look at sovereignty, I think, you know, this very much applies to sovereigns today. If you look at sovereignty, um, it can't make decisions. Sovereignty is always something which is mediated 
you look at the the role of the sovereign um, or sovereigns during the during the COVID period, for instance. You know, um, you look at the sort of the uh, completely chaotic response on the part of um, governments and executives to the COVID pandemic. You look at the way in which um, sovereign decisions always had to be mediated by medical authorities and by sort of chief medical officers and epidemiologists and, and so on. And I mean, it's a classic example, really, of sovereign dysfunction and really the whole very the totally dysfunctional nature of of politics today as well. Yeah. So. I like your, your, you because you brought up Agamben in this context and like mm. the, the doctors are parading around the executives, you know, and they're the, mm. they're, the, they're really the ones that are. That's are right. Kind of, yeah. are, they're, they're the alibis, if you will, for the yes. decision. That's right. Yeah. So, so, so the political decision always has to be, you know, justified now on the basis of science or, or medicine and um, mm-hmm. public health and so on, which, which is, I mean, Agamben talks about the way in which uh you know you know medicine science are really now the now our religion right yeah. i mean they, they have the same structure as as kind of religious authority in a sense and i think i think he's, he's right you could also look at the history of the roman emperors and see that a lot of them were these buffoons that mm. that, that benjamin is, is talking about mm, I mean, mm, a lot of mm. them i mean you don't even have to go to nero you can you can look at a lot of even lesser extreme examples and, mm-hmm. and see the just sort of impotence mm, that exactly that yeah yeah yes exactly and it kind of raises interesting questions about what sovereignty really means today i mean to sovereign mm-hmm. is you know sovereignty is sovereignty anything real or is it just simply called like like a phantasm phantasm or fantasy yeah. it reminds mm-hmm. me a little bit of just to get back to psychoanalysis for a second before mm-hmm. we leave it it reminds me a little bit of uh the joke that that Zizek likes to tell over and over i mean there's many of them but uh one of them is the old conservative father is giving orders to the son and saying, you know, we're going to grandma's house because I said so. Right. And right. There's, there's almost something more refreshing about that than the sort of the liberal father who says, who induces guilt and says, mm. well, well, what, you know, your grandmother would be so disappointed mm. if, if you didn't, if you didn't come and show up. <clears throat> so it's so these different, these different figures of, of sovereignty. And, and it, it, I guess it kind of shows why, not mm. to cut this line short, you can respond to it, but it kind of shows why your point about Schmidt is usually taken to be criticizing liberalism, but to a certain sense, liberalism isn't a strong enough enemy for him, mm. right? That's that's why anarchism is the real that's right. That's right. interlocutor. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, I mean, li- he, he has nothing but contempt for liberalism, where he's, right. he's, he's certain kind of, I mean, he hates an- anarchism and anarchists, but he has a certain kind of respect for them, right? Because, mm-hmm. I mean, they, you know, they're... they're they're, they're full on, right? I mean, they, they what they're seeking is a, is a complete destruction of the of the state order. So they right. they kind of engage in a certain strange kind of absolutism. You see, I mean, the state must be absolutely destroyed, whereas Schmidt is saying the state must be absolutely preserved at all costs. So um, there was another interlocutor that that mm-hmm. I hadn't heard of. You write about, and 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 I thought it was fascinating that there was a similar reflection after the 1848 revolutions with a thinker named Cortez. Right? He he kind of oh, yeah, right, yeah. kind of had a similar type of yeah. reflection where the it's the anarchist that is a worthy adversary yes yes exactly that's right he uh, i think the line from political theology is you know um in schmidt's uh, sorry in, in cortez's eyes you know see so he looked at proudhon and he saw a demon um <laughs> and, he, and he wanted to light the um the funeral pyre with pie with uh, proudhon's body on it and proudhon says go ahead light it <laughs> light me up <laughs> now, <laughs> now, now it, yeah. Okay. Uh, would Cortez have been in uh, in dialogue with with Stirner at the time, or were Stirner still just kind of an under? Because Stirner, what he published the Uniqueness Property in forty four. So eighteen forty four. That's right. I don't know if there was any kind. I doubt it. No, okay. I, okay. I, I don't okay. think so. But I mean, yeah, there's certainly contemporaries. Um, he would have. He would probably said something similar about Stirner. I guess if if Stirner. Yeah, had no been doubt. There. No doubt. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, uh, perhaps we'll get onto this. But of course, yes. you know, Schmidt himself um, had some interesting things to say about Stirner in his prison writings. So that was one of my questions to you, you because this this notion, and I assume it's in the prison writings that mm. you know, uh, and you can tell us a little bit about maybe why Schmidt was interned. I guess he was not seen as a as a zealous enough advocate for the the regime, the Third Reich. Well, no, he was interned in an Allied prison camp after the oh, after, see, after the war you know precisely for being a nazi right or, or, or gotcha for, gotcha you know for, for being one you know the sort of the top constitutional jurist of the of the nazi regime right i mean he was the he was the um you know reich come what his official title was actually but you know the you know for a while at least anyway he was quite high up high up in the nazi hierarchy although he later kind of fell foul of the, the right nazi who, right uh, who thought you know he was this guy's just a kind of an opportunist really and he's not yeah. really a genuinely committed nazi but but anyway, you know, so he was he was in an allied uh, prison camp, um, 
and he wrote about it. You know, his, his prison notebooks, um, mm. Ex Captivitate Salus, is what it's called. It's a very, very short sort of book, but, you know, which is really full of kind of, you know, self-indulgent, uh, self-pity. Yeah. Oh, you know, mm-hmm. oh, it's not my fault. You know, it's just, he, he, I mean, he never, he never, there was never any sign of contrition or, or, uh, <laughs> or remorse, actually, for his role in the Nazi regime, of course. But he does mention that, that Sterner is, is one of the, the ghosts, yeah. so to speak. Who that, comes to visit him. That's right. The, um, the only one, right? The only I, one. I, exactly. What, 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 yeah. what do you make of this? It's an interesting, interesting little, um, kind of dialogue that's going on really because i mean on the one hand he's kind of accusing stern of being a you know he says he's a buffoon he's you know he's a probably a psychopath is you know complete, <laughs> you know his complete sort of uh you know he basically just accuses accuses stern of being a complete oath mm-hmm. uh, on the other hand he kind of rates stern as being one of the kind of you know the sort of seminal german philosophers i mean you know putting yeah. in the same category as as a whole bunch of other thingers i mean sort of nietzsche and uh, uh is it schopenhauer i can't remember actually but i mean a whole it, he has some regard for Stoner, actually, interestingly. I mean, he, and what he says, I think, is that Stoner is one of the few thinkers to recognize that, that the I has no reality or no sort of, you know, philosophical presence or validity or something, else, which is very interesting, actually, because, I mean, Stoner is always, acute, always sort of right. uh, char- characterized being a philosopher of egoism, a philosopher precisely of the I. Where Schmidt's saying actually, you know, Stoner realizes that the I, the I is nothing. The I is kind of a, an illusion, which I think actually is probably the correct reading of Stoner actually so I mean it's kind of hard to know what's what's going on really I mean maybe maybe Schmidt is just kind of you know experiencing some sort of you know mental breakdown and Stoner, <laughs> Stoner's ghost comes to visit him and with a glass with, of milk to uh, with a, com- exactly that's right, bed, right? Ex- exactly that's right yeah <laughs> Be interesting to be a fly on the wall in that prison cell, so wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> right. So well, it, it's kind of interesting that he would accuse Sterner of being, as you said, a buffoon, mm. and and yet he's imagining or he's he's having these delusions that Sterner mm. is visiting him. Maybe mm-hmm. it is. Maybe that's part of his off to the side self realization that hey, maybe I was playing the part of the of the stooge. I don't know. Uh, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's it's hard to know what's going on there. I mean, I, yeah. I think. You could sort of, you know, draw interesting parallels, I suppose, between the sovereign state on the one hand and the sovereign individual on the other. Once again, we would go back to this kind of, you know, mirroring idea of the two, the two sort of polar extremes somehow, somehow reflecting and mirroring each other. You know, yeah. um, so you know, you have Schmidt's notion of the sovereign exception on the one hand, and Stoner's notion of the sovereign individual on the other. Mm-hmm. The one has also completely outside the law and and so on. So, so maybe there's maybe that's something which is on schmidt's mind i I don't really know but yeah um, i just find it very interesting actually that you know um of all the thinkers that uh (laughs) mentioned sterner i mean i mean you know he he obviously he regards him really as one of the you know as a hugely important figure he he says you know that he's one of the uranium mines of german philosophy i know cooper want to talk about Sterner a little bit more so i do want to talk about your chapter um on him and one of the things that i found fascinating just to continue this line was this notion of the, the own mensch, right? The unknown. Oh, yeah. right, and, right. and it kind of reminded me of, you know, obviously it's diametrically opposed in a certain way to the sovereign, although, mm. it, although it has its own exceptional status, although mm. maybe, maybe on the, on the part of the void or the nothingness, but it, it also, uh, it seemed to anticipate again in a mirror fashion, perhaps Nietzsche's Ubermensch, right? The overman. Right. Right. Um, um, yeah. As, do you have any reflections on on this, and maybe say a little bit about the unman just for the the audience? You know, Stoner's point is that the you know the figure of man, which comes from you know from from humanism, is really uh, is really kind of God reinvented essentially. This is right. the basis of his whole critique of Ludwig Feuerbach, right? I mean, Feuerbach is claiming to um, replace Christianity and, and religion with with you know humanism and the figure of man. But Stoner says, well, if you do this, then then man simply becomes a new god. You know, man right. becomes this kind of you know universal kind of moral ideal which mm-hmm. we're re- required to live up to. Man is is a kind of an ideological specter which is imposed upon us. And but you see, when you do this, you just kind of create new forms of alienation, and, mm-hmm. and in a way, the self becomes divided between between man and the unman. In a way, the unman is like the excess or the surplus which is produced through the imposition of the figure of man. And in a way, the unman is is all of those individuals or all of those forms of subjectivity, and even that that sort of dimension of ourselves, if you like. Perhaps we could even call it the Freudian unconscious, which doesn't kind of fit into or conform to this kind of idealized figure of man that we're all supposed to be living up to. So, you know, he talks about the way in which, you know, alongside the 
figure of man, you have the unman, and you can say the unman is like sort of the you know the shadow or the dark side or the underside of the, the figure of man. It's everything which doesn't quite kind of conform to this um, this form of subjectivity which is kind of being imposed upon us, right? So um, there might be a certain kind of parallel you could say with um, with Nietzsche's uh, Uberman, although you know the Uberman, of course, is someone who kind of stands above yes man whereas the unman is something which is kind of you know stands below man if you like or is kind of yeah. subordinated to it it's it's sort of the abject i don't think stoner sees the unman as being this this kind of sort of figure of liberation as such it's more like the the byproduct interesting of um of, of humanist ideology it comes about as, as a result of this of the alienation that we feel in the face of the figure of man god god man was fascinating to me about that and and then i'll let i'll let coop speak sorry coop <laughs> i always do this I get, I get excited is is what you said about that kind of makes the parallel between the unconscious and the unman mm. stand out more because if man stands for like the principle of reason it's mm. you know it, it it makes sense why there would be these parallels with the unconscious which is obviously not support and, and in many ways is is irrational is diametrically opposed to to mm. sort of to hypothesizing the the principle of reason as as this image to look up to this idea, mm, right, right. It's kind of a, it's a resistance to to meta narratives, isn't it? Or well, that which kind of falls outside uh, meta narratives, you might say. I was kind of interested right. just to go back a bit to the um, if yeah. you had engaged at all with uh, Lorenzo Chiesa's work, because we had just had him on last week, and I think mm. there's there are certain. I guess resonances between his work, although it's not directly, you know, espousing political theology. I think it's a little bit more concerned with like a question of what, like, what would you say, materialist? Uh, I guess what a materialist agnosticism or something like that. Yeah, I, yeah, his metacritical realist agnosticism, athe- strong atheism, right? And and he does deal yes. with these questions of of uh, of God and uh, specifically, though. I mean, yeah, I think all mm. of that. It, it's I see a lot of resonances with this question of the what Schmidt talks about as all the all of our political concepts are sort of inherited or tinged with theological implications. Mm, mm. I think that that's part of another place of the resonance that that we're seeing between mm. uh, between between the you two. I haven't read all of his works. I read his book on his early book on on, on Lacan actually. Um, yeah, which was uh, which was I mean difficult, but. Um, but you know, quite quite helpful as well, actually, and yeah. um, and I guess there are certain kinds of parallels um, there with uh, the whole question of kind of you know theology and the the uh, political theology rather, and the um, and and the exception and so on. So um, so I haven't engaged a huge amount with his other works. So I... Gotcha. The not two, I think, was the came out in twenty sixteen, and so he right. also yeah. this was it. It was very interesting because he's also speaking a lot about the sexual non relation. Mm. Moses and monotheism, the future of illusion, like these are also two two mm. pieces that he cites as well in, mm. in his discussion. So I was just kind of curious and thought it was kind yeah. of uh, ironic that you had actually cited you cited one of his translations of Agamben. Was it the uh, the King King of the Glory? Was it the one? On uh, I, for, I forget which one it specifically sounds was. right. That's I think it's right. right. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, no. He's uh, he's uh, he's a formidable um, translator <laughs> of, uh, of of Agamben. That's for sure. Yeah. He's a very, very interesting thinker. I've met him a couple of times, actually. Oh, really? So, oh, interesting. But I, I, don't, uh, not a, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on his, his work, but he's certainly one of the, um, you know, one of the, the uh, foremost readers of, of Agamemnon and Lacan, of course, yeah. uh, out there at the moment. So. Yeah, we should have asked him about anarchism if, if we'd have been more, uh, <laughs> right, you know, more anticipatory. But, right. you know, it's uh, this is, to go back to Sterner, mm-hmm. I think that um, what I found fascinating and of course Coop could speak more to this and, and of course you could as well this distinction he makes between revolution and insurrection mm. and you come back to it at the your conclusion in um in your critical introduction to political theology this notion of kind of deinstituting rather than merely anti-instituting or something do you want right, to say a little right. bit about about <clears throat> his notion of insurrection so the insurrection i mean he 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 Distinguish between the revolution and the insurrection. He says the revolution is about um, changing external social and political and economic conditions, whereas the, the insurrection is really more about a kind of a transformation of the self. And, you know, I think he describes it as a kind of a working forth of me out of power, out of authority. And and I guess the the emphasis really is on a kind of like a sort of, a, if you like, a micro political revolution. You know what I mean? Like, yes. and this is something which can actually precede the revolution. He's not against revolutions as this kind of external transformation 
revolution, but, but he says every every revolution of this kind has to start first with the insurrection, first first with this kind of transformation of the self. Yes. First, the the self has to kind of work itself out of its um, obedience or out yeah. of its kind of voluntary servitude or out of its kind of um, what would you call it a certain kind of obeisance to yeah or enthrallment enthrallment to power. Mm-hmm. So it's a very interesting idea, right? So, so it's it's I think it's to do with this you know, with a certain kind of micro political and micro ethical transformation of the, of the subject or the self. First, what the self has to do is kind of in a way turn its back on power, kind of mm-hmm. become indifferent to power, right? So if you kind of if you fetishize power, if you regard the order of power as being so sort of overwhelming, you know, and so kind of oppressive that you can't do anything about it, then you're always you're always enthralled to it. You're always kind of stuck within it. What the self has to do is somehow transcend power. It has to kind of, in a way, affirm the self over the order of power. And it's only then, it's only then that you can actually kind of um, have a revolution. I really find this a, a kind of a fundamental kind of political concept. Actually, it's something which, which Garman yeah. also makes mention of, uh, I think, in his book on Saint Paul. I can't remember the title of it now, actually, but uh, but yeah, he, he says that you know Stirner's notion of the insurrection is a kind of like a um, a sort of an ethical anarchistic form of revolt, which is quite different from you know the Marxist uh, and Marxist Leninist notion of, of the revolution. So yeah, I mean the the idea of um, a sort of uh, what's called destituent power or mm-hmm. des- destituting power, which is another concept which in a way comes from a garment, although actually not originally from a garment, originally comes from that Argentine collective. Interesting. You know, the idea is that you know the aim of, of politics, if you like, is 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 not to overthrow the order of power as such, because the risk then is that you simply establish a new order of power in its place. I mean, this is the course of any revolution in history, right? I mean, you know, so so it's a way of kind of, as a government puts it, deposing power, kind of turning one's back upon it, yeah. suspending its legitimacy, and therefore inventing new or more autonomous forms of politics, which are kind of outside the order of power. So. Yeah, I think there's there's a resonance there. I think with Stoner's notion of the insurrection, you seem to be working this logic in that conclusion about a kind of a circumvention first before a, a kind of direct instead of the direct course, which always seems to be get us back into what Schmidt was recognizing with Bakunin, a kind of inversion, a you know a satanic inversion that keeps the structure in place. Yes, right? yes, exactly. Yes, that's th- right. Th- that's there's right. like a yeah. circumvision and off to the yes. side. Yes, know, yes, a, yes. A, that kind of tactic. Yes, exactly. Yes, you, you could say that for sure. I mean, the the, the rev, you know the anarchist revolution is quite different from the Marxist revolution, of course, because you know right. the, I mean in a way that you know an, anarchism as as a philosophy is much more sensitive, if you like, to the dangers of, of revolutionary politics than, than mm-hmm. the Marxism or Marxist Leninism, and this is why the anarchists were so insistent on on you know prefiguration and the way that mm-hmm. the, the revolution can't be led by a vanguard and it's got to be it's got to be sort of you know libertarian, etc. Even then, there's a certain kind of danger, I suppose, of the anarchist revolution in kind of, if you like, naively imagining if you simply get rid of the state, you know, we'll be free. It's just way too simplistic. I mean, you, you'll just kind of, you know, you'll just invent new forms of power in, in this place. Um, I think in a way, you know, Stirner's notion of the insurrection and, and the whole concept of destituent power is kind of a, a way, it's a way to kind of, you know, think through this, some of these, some of these, this kind of like revolutionary, you know, deadlock or, or binds that we're in. And I suppose we need to think about what, Radical politics and what revolutionary politics really looks like today. I mean, is is a concept of revolution still still relevant? What does the revolution actually mean? What does it look like? It's certainly going to be very different, isn't it, from the kind of the the classical model of revolution? So we need to think about new strategies, new forms of action, and kind of changing relations at kind of a micro political level. I, I think perhaps is the first step to any any kind of um, political action on on a, on a kind of a broader scale. I was thinking that. One of the things that I found fascinating, too, in this discussion was the way in which the political, theological and the, and the secular are part of Schmidt's dialectic. That's what he's he's kind of gripping with in this age of increasing secularization. And he has mm. kind of four of them, which ends with techniques, which we can get to. I was thinking about your putting forward this notion of the profane, which I love, you know, mm. you give the etymological definition of it's before the temple and mm. yet the with the secular and, and sort of the strange counterintuitive logic of secularization, mm. the, the temple walls extend That's to right. society That's itself. Right. Yes. But you put forward this notion of the profane as a, as a potentially a concept to revive. And you even mentioned a, a sort of potential for a re-enchantment of the world. Do you mm. want to say a little bit about the, the profane in rela- relation to what we've been discussing? The idea of the profane is really kind of a um, 
a certain kind of answer to the problem of secularism. What is the problem of secularism? The problem of secularism is, is it is simply kind of um, you know reinvents religion, right? And this is Stoner's whole critique of, of you know liberal humanist secularism, right? It's simply simply God reinvented, and in a way, you know, with I mean, there's even something that the Marx noticed. He said, you know, the, the you know the American society is the most um, secular society in the world, as well as being the most religious society in the world, right? And, and that's that's still very much the case today. They have very mm-hmm. secular institutions with this kind of you know completely sort of you know all pervasive religiosity, and that's just one of the many sort of interesting facets of secularism, right? That it, it doesn't get rid of religion. On, on on the contrary, it simply kind of entrenches religion within and religious belief within civil society, and as well as the fact that it also kind of um, makes political institutions sacred. Like the punchline, if you like, of my political theology book is that, you know, the we go from the power of religion to the religion of power. Mm, mm-hmm. So, so that, you know, the state becomes the new god or the new kind of order of, of the sacred in, in society, right? So the notion of the profane is something which, which I sort of introduce as a way of countering this perverse logic of or perverse sort of dynamic, if you like, of, of secularism. And the profane is, um, I suppose it's kind of an engagement with the material world, um, mm-hmm. paradoxically, that doesn't mean that paradoxically that's not an experience of disenchantment. It's actually a certain kind of reenchantment of mm-hmm. of the material world and of the natural world, particularly, um, and of sort of natural ecosystems. And so, I have this notion of you know ecological entanglement or entanglement yes. with, with you know planetary ecosystems and you know non-human others and so on. And I, I think you know this is my kind of critical response to political theology. It, it has to have something to do with an idea of kind of an entanglement or re-entanglement or re-enchantment of and with the um, the natural world. Maybe I'm kind of trying to invent a, a new kind of you know paganism or something. I don't know. And why not? You know, a new kind yeah. of pagan sort of anarchistic pagan kind of political theology, which is um, you know which is really all about sort of re-engaging with nature. Certainly, you know, we need to kind of uh, re-enchant the world and re-enchant our lives, I think, in in, yeah. uh, in new ways. It has consequences, or at least it has engagements directly with, with capitalism and its pervasive disentanglement of, of mm. man and, and nature and, and mm. the, the exploitation of nature. This is why your chapter on economics in terms of secularization, in terms of capitalism becoming the new religion. I mean, mm. we have on our money in God we trust, and you, know, mm-hmm. you can see it. But there's a sense in which obviously capitalism is the driving force for the the imminent destruction of nature and mm. disenchanting it to create value and to, to exploit and extract. So there is a sense in which that you called it your words. The, the paganism is a, it's not sort of a, a flight from this world though mm. at all, right? No, no, it's not. No, it's it's a re-engagement with the world. Um, mm. It's an attempt to kind of um, get rid of of abstractions, abstractions, you know, metaphysical abstractions, or to um, to kind of you know to turn back to to the kind of the material world that we we're so, or the natural world, if you like, that we've become so mm-hmm. alienated from. Benjamin um, has a little interesting fragment on capitalism as religion. Right. Which I talk about in the political theology book, and he talks about the way in which, you know, in a way, capitalism is the most kind of religious of religions, right? It's a religion to kind of replace all religions, and it's based upon a whole series of, you know, sort of rituals, you know, consumerism. You know, it's a very nihilistic religion, of course, but it's yes. nevertheless, it, you know, it, it kind of resembles religion in so many ways. And also, you know, it's the whole notion of, you know, the, the way that, you know, finance and credit are really based on, on, on a certain kind of faith, faith in, in the market sustaining itself, even though there's, we've seen plenty of evidence to the contrary. Full faith and credit, right? Exactly. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> So uh, I think I was just reading an interesting book today um, by a guy mm-hmm. called uh, Fabio Vigi, an Italian philosopher. You mm-hmm. should have actually have in your show. Actually, it's very interesting. Okay. And uh, yeah, he talks about that. You know, that we kind of the way in which we're kind of living today in this kind of like you know zombie capitalism, which which doesn't mm-hmm. really just doesn't function anymore. I mean, it's it's obvious for everyone to see that you know capitalism is, is something which is in a sense already dead, and yet we we somehow keep it alive through our everyday practices of, of you know consumption and work and so we, we we have this kind of faith in something which we don't don't even really believe in anymore yet we sustain it through our everyday Ooh. interactions and and behaviors right so um i like that it really tracks the death of god too like mm. yes yes we haven't worked through our as a society or species mm. or whatever mm. haven't worked through the death of capitalism yet no no indeed no it's what interesting you brought up paganism as well because I was thinking, you know, I don't recall what work I'm not I haven't read the I feel like Leotard also engages in with paganism and I don't remember the specific context, mm. but you mentioned meta narratives earlier. So I right. and I I don't recall where he gets into that, but 
I don't know if does he talk about paganism. I, I don't. I don't know. I, he, I feel yeah. like he calls himself a pagan. At oh, perhaps he does. Yeah, perhaps he does. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. I, I wouldn't I, be surprised. I, <laughs> but I, yeah, yeah, I don't know the context uh, to be honest. So I can imagine Leotar having a lot to to contribute mm. to this discussion. Mm. Obviously, of libidinal economy, it's almost mm. as though you know the drive and the desire, the the what do you call it, the Homo consumericus instead of the Homo economicus. This capitalism is dead. Yeah, but, yes. but we're we're still. That, that drive is still trying to, to cir- it's circling the drain, if you will, it's circling yes. the rim. Dry humping yes, the American dream. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Let's see. There was, I definitely had one other thing before uh, I ask you a little bit about the cynics, and I know we can mm. we can begin to to wrap up a little bit if if we want. Your point about Scherner and insurrection made me think back to Freud's myth, and he does, he's uh, circumspect enough to call it a myth, but it does seem to mm. belie the fact that, you know, if, as Scherner says, every revolution, true revolution, if you want to call it that, needs to be preceded by an insurrection, it does kind of mm. belie the fact that there would be this stable state where the overthrowing of the primal father wouldn't involve an insurrection, that there could be some state without from which no power to withdraw to work through or whatever it kind of gives the lie to the myth and, and it makes it mm. seem more like this like a, a noble savage myth as though there were some paradise but the paradise is mm. hoarded over without there being some sort of institutionality from which to withdraw paradise is lost isn't it um <laughs> I mean, in a way, Stern would be against that notion, wouldn't yes. he? He would say that there is no kind of state of liberation to get to. And and, and as, as long as, you know, this is the trouble with the concept of freedom, actually, that, you know, mm. the trouble with freedom as a kind of a mercenary to, to, to kind of go back to Leotard um, mm-hmm. is that, you know, it's always, at the end of the day, it's always someone's particular idea of freedom, which is kind of being imposed mm-hmm. upon other people. And and so Stern actually has a very interesting alternative notion of what he calls ownness. And ownness is a kind of a, it's the idea that, you know, that it's up to the, the individual to kind of, in a way, determine his or her own individual path of freedom, if you like. It's not a question of kind of getting to a kind of a liberated society or a free society. I mean, he would say that's just going to be another form of domination. You and know. Foucault would say the same, right? Well, exactly. That's right. Foucault would say exactly the same, right? Is that, you know, the, um, you know, he was very, he had certain sort of concerns about the idea of liberation because liberation implies, you know, you, you're now liberated, you know, you're now on the other side of the revolution and um, you're free and, and power is no longer a problem. But of course, yeah. you know, there's always going to be power, um, yeah. even if power relations can kind of become more reciprocal and more kind of, you know, less hierarchical and more egalitarian, if you like, there's always going to be forms of power. Mm-hmm. And that's always the, um, that's always the, the kind of the temptation and, and the risk, I suppose, of revolutions. And it's, it's the reality of every politics, I, I guess. So, so we, you know, he says we need to invent ethical strategies for, for promoting freedom. You know, the trouble with the revolution, it's an event, isn't it? It's an event which, mm-hmm. which now kind of liberates you from the oppressive order of power. But that is, to some extent, an, an illusion because, you know, power never really goes away. It can be sort of modified and, and reformed and, and so on. But, you know, you're always going to have um, issues of power and, and, you know, structure and, I guess, certain forms of authority, really, which, which you have to try to kind of invent strategies to sort of, you know, get around or, or think beyond, you know, or um, circumvent. Do you think this is part of Schmidt's fantasy that if, that somehow power, instead of being diffused and sort of intransigent and, and, and insidious, it could be sort of funneled and channeled and concentrated as though that would solve the problem and make it so that, that everybody knows now where power comes from. So it's, it's no mm-hmm. longer this sort of invisible force or behind our backs or whatever, but it's, it's clear yeah. there's, there's yes, one yes. place. Yes, I, th- I think that's absolutely right. I mean, he, this is why... He wants to kind of invent or reinvent a form of strong sovereignty, right? Because I mean, he, he wants the lines of power to be clear or the lines yes. of authority to be clear. I mean, he wants one identifiable source of authority, you know, namely the, the sovereign state. And to do this, of course, he has to call upon, you know, theological concepts to, um, to sort of justify this notion. Schmidt just wants things to be kind of clear and simple and ordered, you know, very, yes. very, very German, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I, right, exactly. Well, law I mean, and order, you know, law and order. But, you yeah. know, of course, the paradox is that to, to have that sort of strong structure of law and authority, you need to kind of, he would say, step outside it. You but know, you also have the sovereign exception. And as you were pointing out, you also need a, a more or less homogeneous populous right and more right exactly or less yes yes that's homo- right. yeah. more or less homogeneous obedience yes yes uh, that's right. Absolutely. so in yeah. a certain way that i guess he wants to bake power into the, the social mm. relation mm. from the get-go and, absolutely and, and leave right. it yeah. leave it unquestioned 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is precisely how Schmidt kind of envisages the polity as, as kind of a, you know, I mean, he says this quite explicitly in his book on, um, it's called The Crisis of Parliamentary Democracy. He mm-hmm. even comes up with a kind of a, a sort of an authoritarian concept of democracy. So democracy has nothing to do with pluralism. It's not about some difference and heterogeneity and diversity and representing different interests. No, on the contrary, it's about sort of, you know, a sort of a homogeneous mm-hmm. form of identity politics, right? Yep. You said it's unequal, right? Or yeah, exactly, exactly. So paradoxically, democratic equality, he says, is premised on inequality. In other words, yeah. you know, there's certain people who are part of the demos mm-hmm. and there's certain people who are kind of outside of the demos or not part of it. I mean, it's precisely what we see in, in contemporary right-wing populism, yeah? Yes. I mean, I mean, yes. you know, the people is not everyone, as far as the populists go. The people is actually quite an exclusionary concept, right? You know, you know minorities and, and immigrants and so on uh, are not yep. part of the people. So if there is one thing that Schmidt is against, it's, it's pluralism. He believes that democracy can actually only function on the basis of a sort of a homogeneous identity. You know, he assumes that people will just kind of all come together and sort of agree and acclaim the leader, the, the political sovereign. Yeah, I mean, it's very you know interesting. I, I think I think quite um, you know obviously very problematic notion yes. of democ- democracy that he's um, he's giving us, right? So yeah, whereby it xenophobia is the mm. social relation, right? The <laughs> the, the, the friend enemy yeah, uh, absolutely. distinction yeah, the, is yeah. what he's worried about. And so if there is right. an enemy within, mm. it has to be exercised. And we could see how that fit in for the time and sort of the results of, of, of that. Absolutely. I mean, the whole function of the friend enemy uh, antagonism is precisely to once again to sharpen the lines of the polity, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, to kind of differentiate insiders from outsiders, you know, the people from the non people or the people from, you know, people of one community versus the people of another community. And, um, you know, you can see where that logic goes, of course. You obviously have to now start eliminating or excluding the yep. internal enemy, if you like, pushing yep. them outside of the, the boundaries of the, of the polity. And I think that this is why I love you bringing up Diogenes and the cynics and right. you talking about them as the first anarchists, because, mm. you know, Diogenes was neither concerned with law or civic solidarity. Mm. It was mm. for him, moral philosophy was not concerned with even knowledge in a broad sense of the cosmos, like, mm. for example, the Stoics. It, it was m- more of a kind of Sternarian type individualism, mm. right? That's right. Well, the, the sovereign individual, the famous um, confrontation between Diogenes in his barrel and, and um, Alexander the Great is sort of, you know, he comes up to, he wants to meet the famous uh, philosopher that he's been <laughs> hearing so much about. And, and he says, Look, do you have any words of wisdom for me, Diogenes? And he says, well, actually, you know, piss off, just get out of my sun. You know, I'm trying to, <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. Trying, to trying to do a bit of sunbathing over here, man. You're standing, you know, you're casting a shadow over me. So, you know, the whole message, I suppose, of... Um, of you know the ancient Greek cynics was to kind of um, you know, it was com- obviously complete sort of irreverence towards um, towards sovereignty and also towards the kind of the, the norms and mores of the uh, of the polis right I mean quite mm-hmm. notoriously uh, Diogenes would walk around naked and masturbate in the town square masturbate, and, masturbate and, in the street and, yeah exactly yeah. that's right so so yes absolutely I mean I mean he he was a kind of an anarchist um, mm-hmm. and also of course there's that cosmopolitan dimension he said I'm I'm the citizen of no polity other than the cosmos I'm a citizen of the world it's totally sort of anti authoritarian sort of defiance of the political order. It's about asserting, if you like, the, sort of the sovereign individual over any kind of political sovereignty, you know, and, and of the law, of course. Um, and also there's a kind of interesting sort of animal, animalistic dimension or animal dimension, if you like, yes. to um, to sort of cynicism. I mean, Diogenes was called the, you know, the dog philosopher. The dog, yeah. And cyn- Diogenes a dog. And because, you know, they, they, they had a sort of concept that, you know, animals were more sort of authentic and honest than, than human mm-hmm. beings and they weren't they weren't bound by convention and law and so on so they chose to live like animals if you like and um the decoded yeah. flows yes yes, <laughs> yes absolutely yeah. you know foucault's last lecture was on um courage of truth was about uh, cynicism and he kind of he mm. also draw, draws a connection with anarchism you know talks about the way in which um in the modern period anarchist revolutionary politics was a certain form of cynicism if you like mm-hmm. of that kind because it was trying to invent not only build sort of like a, a political movement, but also to kind of create or invent a new a new way of life, new way of living outside of the order of the nomos. You know, while we're on the topic of sort of the Greeks in general, I had mentioned seeing, I mean, I don't know, this may be, I can't remember if this is maybe later egoist communist stuff that I've engaged with, but I was thinking about Stirner potentially having a type of like an Epicurean sort of ethics almost. Well, Epicurus was driven out of the, out of Athens by the dictator, right? So uh, I've been thinking about this too, but I want you to respond, Saul. Sorry. 
I think he certainly talks about the Epicureans. I think somewhere in, in the uh, in the ego and its own. I, I mean, so, yes, yeah. yes, yeah, he does. Yeah, I mean, um, he doesn't have a huge amount to say, of course, of uh, about sort of ancient Greek philosophy. He's more concerned with, um, you know, with his kind of uh, you know fellow sort of you know, Hegelians. Hegelian, but um, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess that I guess there'd be certain parallels there. I mean, the um, desire, I guess, for um, for pleasure. I mean, I, I suppose a certain kind of focus upon the um, upon the individual small group of friends. Uh, maybe, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if he draws a connection exactly, actually. But I mean, he might. Uh, it might perhaps come into his notion of the union of egos, yes, as, as yes. a sort of a you know small sort of uh, self-activated group of autonomous mm-hmm. individuals who sort of you know come together, you know, without any any sort of obligations, if you like, right. um, or any sort of binding contract. I mean, he's really talking about, if you like, affinity and, and friendship and, and, mm-hmm. and new, new ways of being together, which are not part of the state, not part of the nation, not part of you know society as such, but these kind of autonomous groups of individuals mm-hmm. who come together because they, they like each other or they want to solve some sort of common problem, they enjoy each other's company or, or whatever. And maybe that's a new sort of model for, um, for politics. I don't mm-hmm. know. I mean, this podcast would be an example of that in action. I think, yes, right? sure, all, sure, yeah. We're, we're all coming not, together. Yeah. See, I think this is one interesting point because you know you've mentioned a little bit about how you know just care or this mm-hmm. these ideas of like the social and caring about others they're not sufficient to really provide a sort of social relation. Mm. So on conversely, how I read sort of mm. my sort of take on Sterner or like what I'm drawing from is that there's a sort of recognition that the other is necessary for jouissance or for enjoyment and to recognize that Mm. it's only through interaction with the other that we're able to experience any sort of jouissance or you know enjoyment as yeah that's right i mean individuals right yeah i mean mean, once again i mean stern is often sort of accused of or you know mischaracterized if you like as being this kind of you know solipsistic individual um, right. who has no relations with with anyone else and it's just it's just not true I mean, what, what he says is you know relations with others shouldn't come out of i guess a sense of obligation or um legal right or anything like this i mean you know comes out of a genuine love for one another you know a genuine kind of pleasure that one takes in the company of another right i mean intercourse Inter- that's right yeah intercourse of very you know, <laughs> various various forms um, <laughs> so <laughs> that's right so uh, so you know it's um it is about Jewish thoughts, actually. Um, and maybe we should think about politics in this way, not, not so much a question of sort of, you know, obligation or um, loyalty to a certain kind of ideal, but politics as a form of enjoyment of the other, enjoyment of, of you know, of being together with others. You know, maybe there should be a place for that in, uh, in, in radical politics, perhaps. Maybe we need we need a bit less kind of uh, revolutionary piety, um, yeah, exactly. and, and and a bit more um, a bit more pleasure and, and, and kind of love and, and affection and um, and so on. This gets to your uh, discussion of Ivan Illich, right, and tools right, for con- right. conviviality. Do you want to mm. say a little bit about conviviality in this context? In a way, this kind of goes back to my notion of, of kind of profane politics, in a yes. sense. I mean, Ivan Illich is, is very interesting, actually. It's an absolutely fascinating thinker who, who, you know, who talks about the ways in which we can kind of, I guess, invent sort of autonomous relations, autonomous forms of technology, autonomous modes of kind of interacting, which kind of outside of, of sort of big commercial and, and sort of state institutions, whether it's right. you know, the education or the pharmaceutical industry or the healthcare industry and so on. In his various text, he makes arguments for, you know, humanly scaled technology and relying upon sort of, you know, sort of local forms of knowledge, for instance, which mm. haven't been sort of... Um, Sort of institutionalized, right? So, mm-hmm. so what, you know, I think you know what, what he's you know very concerned about is, is a way in which um, the education, like you know, schooling makes us stupid. You know, the healthcare sector makes us sick. sick. Yeah, and uh, you know, we're in in many cases we're better to rely upon sort of you know sort of human scaled interactions and forms of technology and so on. So, you know, it, it's part of this kind of way of uh, I guess sort of defetishizing big institutions and defetishizing the idea of authority. Those who claim to be in a position of uh, scientific authority don't necessarily, or you know, <laughs> don't necessarily know what they're talking about, and they've kind of taken the power out of the hands of ordinary people to kind of you know solve their own problems in a in a sort of a sort of humanistic way, if you like. It seems like a kind of scientific and technological insurrection that's being. Yes, 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 about. absolutely. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, I find his critique of technology very interesting. He's not against technology, of course, but but he's he's, he's against the way in which um, a certain kind of, if you like, techniques going back to Schmidt's notion of techniques and so on, a certain set of kind of techniques in a way has in a way become 
you know, a new religion, it's totally sort of alienated and abstracted from people's sort of ordinary experiences. And, and in a way, technology, you know, or you know, a certain kind of attitude to technology does sort of end up controlling and dominating us to the point where we simply become an appendage of the machine. You brought up uh, Lewis Mumford in this. Yes, 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 who, that's right. Deleuze and Guattari cite Lewis Mumford in anti Oedipus when they mm. talk about the despotic territorial machine as as the it has men for parts, right? It's the mega mm. machine in in Mumford's sense, and uh, yeah, that kind of gets to your point about the alienation. I was, mm. I think I said it last week, Coop. So I'm sorry for repeating myself, but in the Grun Risa, you know, Marx is talking about invention has become a business. Like, there's a sense in which you know, science and technology, it's still driven on the main. I'm not going to castigate every scientist, but on the main by capitalist accumulation. And there's, mm. and I think that that's not a tool for conviviality. That's a mm. tool for surplus value. Sure. Yeah. You see, the thing is, this problem of technology isn't simply about the fact that it's kind of driven by capitalism and the profit motive. Mm. I mean, in a way, technology has its own domination, if you like. Gotcha, um, so gotcha. e- even the use of technology in, in social societies would be problematic in a different way. But you're right in the sense that, you know, the task, if you like, is to kind of be able to, um, would be the capacity, for instance, of ordinary people to kind of, you know, control technology rather than being controlled by it and to, if you like, invent their own forms of technology. I like what um, Ivan Elch has to say about cycling. You know, he says, you know, um, because yeah, I'm, I'm doing quite a lot of cycling myself, actually. It talks about, that, <laughs> you know, the, you know this, this obsession with, you know, motor transport, for instance, like, and going faster all the time. Like, the faster you go, the slower you go. You, you know, you... you Savage as, jams. Exactly. is evident yeah. to any cyclist cycling past, a, you know, um, a highway has become a parking lot. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's just it's just one of his um, many examples, really, about the way in which um, this obsession with technology and progress doesn't necessarily make things better or even do right. what it's supposed to do. And it reminds me, you know, tools for conviviality always reminded me of, you know, when Simon Don talks about the machine, his point is that a lot of discussions about machines and technology is wrongheaded because it assumes that there is an antagonism naturally, when in fact it is our, it's kind of our social relation to machines that puts us in this privilege of subordination or antagonism. Is Illis kind of thinking similarly in this way? Well, we're kind of caught in the trap and the way in which we kind mm-hmm. of usual, utilize machines and technology and so on, uh, essentially. I mean, it'd just be interesting to think about what he would say if he were alive today in this kind of, um, <laughs> you know, sort of virtualized world yeah. in which we live, uh, you know, the world of, um, you know, social media platforms and uh, this sort of total immersion um, mm-hmm. in, in a way in mm-hmm. which he, in technology, in a way in which even he couldn't have, uh, have appreciated or imagined. You know, there, the, sort of the, the digital panopticon, as, uh, as uh, yeah. Bjorn Chuhan calls it, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's, it's just, I mean, I, I can see this in my, in my own case, actually. I mean, I just spend way more and more time each day on, on sort of social media, and it's just it's ruined my reading habits, my concentration habits. Right. I mean, just, um, I, I mean, I really think it has kind of, you know, reprogrammed the human mind in, in a way yes. which is not exactly positive. There's a danger there, but I'm, I'm, obviously I'm not against technology. Technology yes. has its uses. I mean, how, how can one be against technology? What does it even mean? But on the other hand, we have to be aware of its dangers, of course, and um, be aware of the trap that technology presents for us. When you were writing about that, it really affected me. And I assume a, a lot of our listeners, I, I can imagine, you know, you were stating facts about how on average, nine hours a day, which is right. generally more than we sleep, we were spending nine hours mm. a day on social media or mm. something mm. like that, or plugged yeah. in. And you also mentioned kind of, there's this uptick in distractions, or in that, you can just imagine social media and the little dopamine drip of the interactions, there's a way in which it can spiral and get us into a kind of distracting state. I'm distracting is, is, is very homo, homo distractus. I mean, no, yeah, yeah, there I mean, you go. Curious. Yeah, no, that's true. I mean, this is how this uh, form of, I guess, domination of power works, right? But by just keeping us constantly distracted, constantly sort of, you know, plugged in and, um, wired up to the machine and um, craving for stimulus. The reason why we, we can't function today uh, and the reason why there's so many problems with, you know, sort of mental illness and, and so on is is uh, is the fact that we, we, we're constantly bombarded with information and uh, constantly distracted. Yes. You know, we, we just suffer from a kind of a, an overload of um, stimulus, don't we? Stimulation. Yes. So it's not good. We have to wean ourselves off this somehow. And I think that that's part of the this dialectic, this dynamic, there is a sense in which that constant stream of information and stimulus is a disenchantment. There can be happy mediums. It's difficult. I found it difficult for myself, mm. uh, knowing 
when to unplug or when to, because social media can, I mean, this is how Cooper and I met. So it can, obviously, that's just a good example of, mm. it can foster friendships and, and connecting with people. Course, and obviously yeah. at the same time, it has a way of, of getting under control and it can, mm. it can become addictive. We've all experienced, I'm sure, different valences of this. So there is that need sometimes to to step back and, and re-enchant. Mm. And, and absence makes the heart go fonder. There's a sense in which I've luckily found more and more happy mediums with online presence. And I think it's mm. made it it's made it more enjoyable for me and made it less distracting but it's not a, it's never a perfect thing and it's and you're always you're always, i'm always uh, about to relapse right <laughs> yeah yeah yes indeed uh, i know what you mean cooper do, do you have any last questions do we want to yeah i, I think mean, we can we, effectively wrap up but i did have one question that i don't know that saul will be able to answer that well but i am just curious try. because yeah. I, I was curious if you've engaged with francois laurel at all and the reason why is because yeah. taylor translated what is it introduction to Non -philosophy? Uh, there's philosophy and non-philosophy, the dictionary mm -hmm. non-philosophy, some uh, a bunch of bootleg essays, but yeah. Right. Anyhow, so we have done some episode. We I think we tackled maybe a couple chapters of the work, and so I was just recognizing a lot of valences with, um, with Sterner. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, Sterner. That's, yeah, I had them. That that's very interesting. I mean, I, in some ways, I was kind of afraid you you wouldn't ask me about Larry Elks. Oh, okay. Good. He's, he's one of the philosophers. No, sorry. Yeah, I was, I was, yeah, I was afraid that you you would ask me about it, but ah. um, in, in in a sense, it's just not, it's just a thing I, I don't know particularly well. Um, I mean, I, I, apart from this kind of superficial sort of familiarity, but um, but yeah, I mean, uh, but he's one of the things who's sort of been on my radar, I suppose, and I really should um, one day take the time to to read him. But uh, yeah, the idea of non philosophy, I mean, I, I guess um, it's a kind of a it's a form of atheism, I suppose, isn't it? Or if, if you like, would that would that be it's a, a certain kind of characterization of uh, correct characterization of, of Larry Well, I mean, in, in a way, it's thinking in a way along the lines of Stern's atheism. I would call it a non theism, just to non -theism, be right. just to be Laruelian about it. But because it kind of gets back to our discussion with Chiesa, which is just that it's not a dogmatic assertion of the non existence of God, but it can suspend, right. it could suspend the validity of the question to a certain extent. Mm, but mm. Uh, but you know, Sterner's creative nothing that doesn't identify with the fixed ideas of all these different attributes that are an identity. Right, there, right, there, right. There's a lot that, that I see uh, in relation to, you know, Laura, while talking about man as one, as being foreclosed to thought, right. being, being foreclosed to all of these identities that mm. don't define the unique, so to speak. Right. Right. It's right yeah, there right, in the name, okay, the yeah. unique, the one. You know, yes, 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 <laughs> yes, that's right. No, look, I, I really should I really should pick him up, actually. Um, yeah, it's, look, it's, it sounds like there's a certain parallel with um, with Stoner there, and um, mm -hmm. just to think I'm just not, um, I just what? don't know very well to be able to sort of comment in any sort of intelligent fashion on it. So. <laughs> well, it's, it's, well, that's how I feel when Cooper brings up Stoner. Right? <laughs> I'm, I'm just kind of riding the wave, you know, where I, I, I pick up a little bits here and there. Right, and, right. Uh, but I am going to have to read uh, the unique and his property, and uh, your yeah, sure, your, yeah. your rendition of him and your chapter on him was another spark. It definitely got some some light bulbs going and, and got me excited. Mm. And just I'm also very glad that your works on Schmidt have really crystallized mm. a lot of ideas for me and a lot of avenues and made a lot of things clear. And it makes sense why he's he's still someone to to deal with. But hopefully, mm. with your engagements. You know, there's there's a path through or around. It's interesting, isn't it? That you know, Schmidt is is a thinker who who still continues to fascinate people. All of this uh, century after political theology was written, this was mm -hmm. 100, 100 year anniversary actually. That's right. 19, that's right. Twenty twenty two. In fact, I'm actually going to a conference next week in Rome, which is on oh, wow. on political theology one hundred years on. Fascinating. Um, so so yeah, I mean, he's obviously you know hugely influential thinker who's become much more influential just in, in sort of recent decades, really. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the same time, I think you know, I think he's he's a thinker who, I mean, yes, he's still useful to some extent, but I mean, he's is you know, also incredibly limited in many ways for kind of thinking beyond or outside of the paradigm of, of sort of state sovereignty and, um, and and political authority. So with the rise in popular nationalisms and well, exactly, and that's right. Yeah, yeah, it keeps him relevant. It's why it does. It does. Why he's got to be handled. <clears throat> you know, as a serious, uh, as a yeah, serious ab ab no, no question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. The reason I had thought right. to bring up Laurel as well was because I think of your interest in not only Stirner but this sort of right. uh, political theology. I mean, these are kind mm. of areas where there might be some 
interesting, you know, mm. potentially stuff for you to look into in the future. I'm not yeah. as sophisticated with my understanding of Larwell to speak, you know, definitively, but again, there seem to be at least some, I guess, superficial. I, I would, I will definitely, after, after, after listening to this, I will definitely um, start reading him actually. Excellent. I'd well, <laughs> you've, you've well, inspired me. I'll, uh, you certainly piqued my curiosity. So. Excellent. Well, you and, and you've I started reading Schmidt's work because of preparing for this, and it's gotten me thinking about, about things in a, in a new light. So what we would love to do is, since you're officially a friend of the show now, uh, <laughs> you know, we would love to have you back once. Once I've read Lara Well, <laughs> well no, is that what you no, mean? No, oh, oh. Once, <laughs> once, back up, let me just one, about Lara well. Once your new book is out, and perhaps we okay, can have okay. your uh, is it is it Langford? Is yeah, Peter Langford. Yes, you know, I'm yeah, sure he'd be he'd be he'd be more be, than happy to. Yeah, it'd be, be great, great to have both of you on, and sure, we could, sure. we, could, we could talk more about Schmidt in depth. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so he's this this guy is a sort of a Schmidt uh, Schmidt maven. I mean, he's he, <laughs> even, even even more so. I mean, a Schmidt you know expert Schmidt fiend. No, he'd he'd be more than happy to do that. And also, like I said, I mean the the Sterner conference too. I think is, is yeah. a great idea. So um, awesome. So, so let, let me know if you yeah, have further, further thoughts about that. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely keep in touch on that note. I'll re- I'll start putting out some feelers to some of the other mm-hmm. folks. I have a, have already done preliminarily, but no one um, just some like casual friends. But excellent. Yeah, we'll, keep, we'll keep in touch as far as that goes. But Saul Newman, thanks okay. so much for joining us on this week's yeah. edition of Machine and Conscious Happy Hour. No problem. Thanks. thanks it was Saul. Great. Great to great, great, to great meeting you. Absolutely. You too. Likewise. Yeah. All right. We'll be in touch. Take care. Have a, have a good night. Bye. Good night. Bye bye. The very rules of eating of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is how can change the whole state of things into a violence without object and This is the typical violence of Violence because what happens there is the murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. What I mean is the following. Nothing left but recycled, whitewashed, lobotomized people, as in a block work orange. <laughs>